Well, welcome to our interview with the legendary Irish singer Daniel O'Donnell. Now, with a career spanning over four decades, he sold something like, I think, 10 million albums. I don't know whether there's probably more than that, but at least 10 million albums. The only artist in the world to score a hit in the UK album charts every year since 1988. Now, that's an unbroken 35-year span. He's captivated audiences around the world with his distinctive voice, his heartfelt performances and genuine genuine charm. So, Daniel, thanks very much for coming in. We really morning. appreciate you it's coming lovely in. lovely to be here. Nice to see you both. You've been in the music industry for a long time. What do you what do you enjoy the most about performing? Well, I love the performing. You know, I love the opportunity to sing. Um, I love meeting people too. You know, I've always uh, met people after the shows and still do. And I think that's probably you know, what's what's best about it. Sometimes, you know, people say to me, because I travel so much, they say, you know, what? where's the nicest place you've been? Or what? And my mind always goes to who do they meet? And I've been in beautiful places, but I always seem to go, to who did I meet in that place? So obviously people are more important than places for me. Um, I've been very fortunate. I've enjoyed it immensely, so... You know, what can you say? Has mm. that always been? You've always loved, are you a people person? I think so. I think irrespective of what I would have done in, in career or, or my life, to have interaction with people would have been the most important thing. And I mean, this, um, I get to sing, I get which I love. I love the music. I love the singing. But then I get to meet people. And the other thing about it is that I'm meeting people with a, in a very positive situation. And, you know, positivity will always fuel you, you know. And um, because the people that come to the shows buy a ticket, they want to be there. You know, so you're not mm. going out to, to fight. You're <laughs> going out to, to he- meet people that, that want to hear what you're doing. And, and so it's, 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 a, it's a lovely way to spend your life. What, what do you hope people to take away from your concerts? I suppose that they enjoy it. Um, yeah, th- that they just enjoy it, and for the period they're there, they're they're transported. A lot of people have difficulties in their lives, and I suppose I always think that for the while that they'd be at a concert, it would be great to think that they could leave whatever troubles they had outside. It won't change what's outside, but music is a great healer, I think. And also music has no barriers, you know. There's no there's no black, white, creed, colour, doesn't matter, you know. It's everybody just can enjoy music. So do you always meet fans after I do, your concerts? I do. So you would thousands and thousands of concerts and over the years I've met a lot, you know. Yeah. And and I, I do think that um singers or people who perform who don't meet people, they really don't realise what they're missing. And sometimes they say, well, you know, really big, big stars couldn't do it. I think everybody could do it for for a period. They could do it for for, for a period. And I just go out. I, I, when I started, I used to meet the people and there was always, I mean, there was a lot less in the beginning. But I just continued and... Um, when I come out on the stage, when we do our shows here in New Zealand, I'll recognise people from it, before. You'll remember. You know, well, I, I'll know them because they were there before. Uh, yeah. And that's because I got to meet them. And if I just, I always think if you go somewhere and meet nobody, you wasted your journey. Mm-hmm. So, mm. Has that changed over the years? Has, has it become more of a security issue over the years or not? I haven't really had any... You know, I haven't had any issue with security, you know. No, I haven't. I just go with it and enjoy, yeah. Your fans are are nice people. Yeah, they're not the kind to rush the stage, (laughs) you know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Talking this morning. I'm waiting, you know, but it's never (laughs) happened. (laughs) Daniel, can you share a memorable experience from your career that's had a significant impact on you yourself? Well, you know, there's, I suppose, down through the years, there's different times, different things that has, you know, meant uh, something in my career, some maybe things personally. Career-wise, 
Um, you know, I made my first record in 1983, and I... Nobody asked me to make a record. It wasn't like somebody discovered me and said, oh, you know, will you, will you make a record for us? I just made the record myself and I paid for it and, you know, sold it myself. And so that that was important. It was important to make that record. Um, then an, uh, I recorded a song called I Need You about 1985, 86. And that was the first song that got airplay on uh, and, and BBC and, and, and the UK radio and that sort of was the next step from Ireland you know to go to the UK to become and more international yes mm. um, what was it like hearing you on the uh, on yourself on the radio for the first time amazing yeah amazing it's just unbelievable I suppose you don't almost yeah it's amazing and then in 1992 um, I don't know whether you got top of the pops on the television here or not, but it was very much on our television. And top of the pops was the, the chart um, records, and they had a show called Top of the Pops every week. And I grew up watching it, but the type of music that I do wouldn't have been what featured, especially in my generation on it, you know. Mm. Um, but in 1992, I recorded a song called I Want to Dance With You that got in the charts, and I got on top of the pops. And that was very significant, you know. I was on with the shaman. I don't know if you know the shaman. I mean, they were very, very different to what I was doing, and they had earrings and <laughs> nose rings and all sorts of things. And I was here in my, you know, my very suit, and it looked, you know, like a dog's dinner. <laughs> and I think they were as afraid of me as I was of them. <laughs> <laughs> Where did he come out of? Because you've had, you, you're very consistent. Uh, you know, there's Daniel O'Donnell, his style, his look, his his music. You it stayed the you, same. Well, you I deliberately loved, kept I suppose that? I, I enjoyed what it... I started singing what I was singing because I loved it. And many times people say, well, would you like to do something, you know, different. And I think, but why? Why why do you do something different just to be different? I just did what I loved, and I was lucky that there was an amount of people that liked it. And too. that's something you still today, just, you love, I it, love it, and you I, do that's it. That's all I... When people say to me, why? Well, how do you pick your songs? I love them. I I want to sing them. Do you pick all the songs do, on your, so you? Do. You do. You decide doesn't that. doesn't like it. My fault. Hands up. <laughs> Hands up. Pretty, uh, we're kind of on TV because there's a camera here, so <laughs> it'll be somewhere. Do you have any, I suppose, guiding principles or values in terms of you know your 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 professional life and your personal life? Well, I suppose in terms of just I I always think that we need to treat people well. And if you can do good, do good. I, I, I always always think too that if you have something negative to say about something, just keep it to yourself. You know, if you can lift somebody up, you should raise them. But, you know, there's enough taking people down in life without somebody pushing them down. So I, 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 I'm, I, 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 I would never... I don't like negativity or, or, or just trying to run people down. That's that's a big thing with me. I mean, obviously, when you are a, a you know, you put yourself out there as a celebrity, you will get some criticism yourself from certain certain parts of the. You do. You, you how know, do you handle that? I do just you? don't read anything. <laughs> I don't read anything. I don't look at Facebook, because you know, sadly. You know, now everybody has an opinion. And it's very easy to have an opinion when nobody actually hears you say it. Mm. Mm. Because nobody answers you immediately. No, and then if you, if, if you, I mean, I've seen things on Facebook and I think, I don't need to know that. I know everything about myself. So, and I know if the show was good and, you know, so I don't. I just think that it's a good thing for promoting and for 
making if somebody needs help if there's a charity or there's somebody falls on you know bad times and they need a bit of help it's great to be able to publicize there's a negative side to it too but i just take the good out of it and you know leave the negativity to one side is there anything any hobbies any any interests of yours that perhaps fans would be surprised about oh not really i play a bit of golf that's not great <laughs> and I love, I love, I play bridge. Oh, do you? I absolutely love it. That's good for the brain, yes. isn't it? Yeah, I, l- I only started playing bridge in 2016. But I always played cards. We grew up in a very rural part of Ireland in County Donegal. And we played cards all the time. And Were and you competitive? Absolutely. <laughs> There's no view from the valley. <laughs> If you're not at the top of the hill, you can't see what's ahead. <laughs> what sort of what sort of cards did Jim mostly play? <laughs> well, we played at home. We played every kind of rummy, and we played twenty five games. Played a lot. Of, I played a lot of whist, which is kind of maybe the reason why I was so drawn to bridge. But honestly, bridge is the best thing that ever I did. It's it's like you open your hand, and the people now that don't play cards are thinking that I'm away with the fairies. <laughs> but you open your hand and you look at your hand and you have to describe almost like a picture. I have to tell you what's in my hand without showing it to you. So it's brilliant. Anyway, that's my hobbies. Mm. Do you have time for them? I do, Because how, I how do. do you juggle the... Bridge, the, the... I suppose if there, was, if there was anything good come out of COVID, um, and I'm sure there's a number of good things you know, that a lot of bad but uh, at the time. But it meant that we had to get used to doing things online and you can play bridge online and I do that a lot. And I play with partners from home and I could be in America and they're at home and I'm playing and we're playing a competition. Uh, so that's, you know, something that is amazing that you're able to do it in that way. Mm. Talking of COVID, we were talking uh, before we, we started the interview about the impact that the COVID had on your, obviously, singing career because of the, the lockdowns and that you weren't able to, you know, do your normal concerts. So you decided on another way of keep, keeping singing. Can you, can you share with us? Well, I did some things on Facebook, like lots of singers were going on Facebook and I went on after a long, a long time of being afraid of going, I'm not very technical. You know, and I'm not great with computers, but we I did go on and did nights singing for people watching wherever they wanted to watch. But I suppose what I did at home was the local hospital, uh, which was about, I don't know, 10 minutes from where we, not even 10 minutes from where we live. Um, I'm very aware of it. And I thought I, I would go up at Christmas time and sing you know, they have a, a mass on Christmas morning and myself and a school friend of mine would go on and sing at the mass and sing a few songs. And over the years, then you'd go on different times and have a few songs. So I thought maybe I could do that, you know. And and I went up. I called the, the this matron in charge and I knew know that knew they had a garden that the, the, the day room circled, you know, or the, where they would sit. So <clears throat> I said, could I come up? It's, it's, mo- it's more of an old folks' home, than it, but it was, a ho- it was the hospital I was born in, but it's mm. now an old folks' home. <laughs> and um, she said, sure. So I went up, I got a speaker, went up, and I sang in the windows to the, pe- the, the residents and uh, got on good. And then I thought maybe I could do a bit more of that. So I, we were restricted, as I'm sure you were, to two kilometres. And... Um, I wrote to or sent a message to the guards or as you call them police and um, they gave me permission. They sent me an, an email saying that if I was found outside my two kilometres, once I had my speaker with me, <laughs> it was OK. I was OK. <laughs> so I, I went to the nursing homes and, you know, places that people were in. And I suppose I sang maybe for a half an hour or an hour in the windows. Or maybe on some days they would take the people out. Um, they were able to sit in the garden if the weather was good. And it just was something I could do that was easy to do. 
and I would call up in the morning. There was no big preparation because nobody was going anywhere. So I may call up a few nursing homes and say, you know, this is Daniel here and I'm going to be passing today. Would it be any benefit to you if I sang a few songs? If you can open the windows and the doors, I'll stand outside. So I charged my speaker every night <laughs> and uh, if the weather was good the next day, off I went. <laughs> so did you have backing music? I just had I had my music like on the phone yeah. and I was able to plug it. I bought a speaker especially for it. Wow. I asked about it. The first day I went, I got the speaker from the undertaker that he uses <laughs> at the funerals. <laughs> and I knew that he had, because I, at, at, sometimes at funerals I would have sung. I know it's funny. It's a strange setup. <laughs> so I called the Sean McGlynn, who's our local undertaker, and I said, Sean, could I borrow your speaker? So I headed to the hospital with the undertaker speaker and I sang through that. And then I thought, well, I can't be borrowing the speaker. So I asked our sound man, what should I get? So I went, but Magella, my wife, would book, bought this speaker online. The speaker arrived and off I went. Well, the, the heart of, of Daniel, I think that's wonderful that, you know, even during COVID. Well, now some people did say, you know, smart folks said that, you know, it was torture because these people couldn't leave the <laughs> nursing homes. And I was singing in the one. I'm, so sure, they, so they, I'm sure they loved it. They had it. no option but I'm to listen. I'm sure they loved it. <laughs> now, Daniel, I've, I've read somewhere an, an article about a TV show that you and your wife do um, yeah. going visiting... Um, B and B places. Yes, we did. We did a number of them. We actually did four different series. We haven't done one now for a while. Um, we did three in Ireland. It's called the B and B Road Trip, and then we did one in a camper van in America. Now I understand. I read in this article that your wife uh, Magella had to keep you a bit, you know, grounded from the from the fans. Is that is well, that right? To well, I don't you know, know. Yeah, <laughs> she does all the driving. You see. Oh. Not because I can't drive, but she's a bad passenger. <laughs> and uh, she just is, you know... Tells you how, what, my, where to turn. That's my story, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> she's not here to tell the real story. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we had a great fun. We had great fun, and we, we, we went around... Uh, you know, I didn't really intend, or we didn't think about doing a show like that. But we were talking one day, and... Somebody said about things we might do and Magella and I thought about a travel show to show people what Ireland was like. And uh, then I said it to my manager and all of a sudden this TV company had this thing and I thought we would do it in a few years but like we were on the road about a month later recording this TV show and it really was just ridiculous and funny, we what we didn't intend it to be funny, you know. We were going out all serious as we thought, but people just got a great kick out of it. And the reason I think it was it was like that is because we were meeting everyday people, and we were going into B and B houses, which I'm sure there's is there bed and breakfast yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a huge thing in Ireland. Always has been. I sometimes I don't know if other countries have it to the same level that we have it. Um, so we did three series of that just called Daniel and Magella's B&B Road Trip <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of fun You're obviously passionate about Ireland um, I'm quarter, quarter Irish myself actually my father's father immigrated oh, out here from yeah. Ireland uh, any, any you know, good potato recipes that you can pass on? You know, the, the, the Irish are well known for their love of potatoes Well potatoes, when, if you want potatoes now, I'm no cook. I, that's, I have to now, first of all, say that. I'm not a cook at all. I wash the dishes. <laughs> but no, I'm not a cook. But w I'll tell you what I love if you did of potatoes. Put onions in through the potatoes. Did you ever do that? Fry them first? No, just yeah? no. in and mix them up. Ooh. The potatoes are, are boiled, mashed, and then they cut up the onions. That's a nice one. Gorgeous. This is the Daniel O'Donnell cooking show. I know. <laughs> it's never, its beginnings. I mean, what is the world coming to? <laughs> and you'd have to have a dab of butter on top of that uh, as probably well. Probably the butter would have to be in it too. Now, we do <laughs> like a mince. I don't know whether do you do, do you have mince out here. Well, my favourite thing is mince and potatoes. I just love it. 
You can have all the fancy foods in the world, but give me mince and potatoes. <laughs> you couldn't beat it. It's home, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Is retirement on the horizon? Well, I suppose I'm at the age now when I'm cutting down a bit. You know, I, I, I don't tour as much as I used to, although I suppose this year we'll probably do up to 80 live concerts, which wow. is still a lot. Mm. But, I mean, there was a period when I would have done maybe 250 a year. Um, so, yes, I mean, I am cutting down. Will I retire? I don't know. I just... You love it I too don't much. know that I would say I would ever retire. I may not be out every day or every week or every month, but I would like always to be... Uh, some I answered somebody one day and said, I won't always tour, but I hope I'll always sing. Mm. You know, singing has brought me a lot of joy in my life, you know, and um, I suppose that's something that I would miss, the joy that it's brought me, whatever maybe other people would have gotten out of it, and I hope, you know, that, that people have enjoyed it. Or I know they have, so there's no point in me saying... I hope they did. I, you know, there's are people who have enjoyed the music I've done, but you know, I've 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 got a great deal of of happiness out of what I did in my career. So, yes, I mean, I think there is a time when everybody has to, you know, say, well, that maybe is enough uh, of doing that. But who knows? <laughs> oh, it's been wonderful having a chat this morning, and you feel like you're sort of, um, yeah. Uh, chatting with this amazing singer who is so well known and yet it's just been great having you in the studio and uh, just finding out a bit more about you. Well, Daniel, thank thanks you. so much for coming in. Thank you very much. And thank we're, you. we're looking forward to seeing everybody at the shows too.